Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Wide Open Throttle. And joining us this week, Roadkill's David Freiberger and Mike Finnegan. So we're going to jump right into a topic they're well familiar with. <laughs> Audi S4. <laughs> Versus the Volvo S60, which yes. I'm sure they're even more familiar with. Well, that's yeah, exactly. Well, that's an interesting, you know, Audi's just uh, upgraded the S4 or changed it around. It seems to be this downsizing of engines continuing. Um, but what's the verdict, Carlos? It's a very effective car, but not a very emotional car. I think we covered that quite a bit on the ignition. And comparing to the Volvo, the Audi won that head-to-head. -head but by a slim margin. I felt it was, it was one of those weird things where I go, and the car I'm driving, the Volvo, loses, and then I felt so bad about it, because <laughs> the Volvo is such a nice car. But like, you know, it's, it's funny, I was just in Sweden with the Polestar guys, and, and there's 35 of them. And what limits them is the hardware they have to work with. They're stuck with the, uh, the six-speed automatic transmission, whereas Audi, they have a seven-speed dual clutch. You know, so it's it's like, man, the Volvo's good, but it just can't compete with the deep pockets that Volkswagen Group has. The the engine in the Volvo, right? It it it, it rated it, I forget, like 325 horsepower. Yeah. The Audi is rated at 333. It's and the Volvo probably makes 325. The Audi makes 410. We got it to 60 in 4.4 seconds, 3,900 pound sedan. It is an all-wheel drive uh, car that can launch like a bat out of hell. Because of power though, you launch with power, right? Oh, you launch high at like 7,000 RPM and dump the clutch. Oh, Things gonna good. rip to 60. <laughs> that's yeah, 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 but, but, yeah, but that's power, you, 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 you know what I mean? Like, so it, 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 uh, the engine's so overrated. So, you know, they're stuck with the underrated. Volvo. Underrated. Uh, under, under, underrated, excuse me. Yeah, because they claim like zero to 60 in 4.9. Yes, we got but it. we got, we got four, a 4.4. Four. Four. You guys are good drivers. <laughs> it's all the car. You hit a button, you hit both pedals, and then you release the brake and you just hold on. Now I can remember a time when, you know, Audi were just sort of kind of these oddball, slightly boring cars from Ingolstadt and Bavaria. Now they're right up there with BMW and Mercedes. They're still the boring. Tr the Troika. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's the Troika of, you know, the luxury yeah. brands. I mean, could Volvo ever get there? I can't see it. It's just not big enough. It's but, but but 20 years ago, if I said, could Audi ever get there, what would you have said? The same thing. Yeah, but yeah. can can Volvo invest in the product? Th their only hope, I think, well, not their only hope, but one of their hopes is this Polestar team. So what I was doing in Sweden was these guys, they Polestar, until now, what it's meant in the U.S. is you get a chip that doesn't void the warranty. You get 25 horsepower and you still have your full warranty. What these guys are doing with this production one, the S60 Polestar, it's a bigger um, twin squirrel turbocharger, it's new uh, exhaust pipes, it's uh, bigger intercoolers and the chip, and all new suspension with 76 changes to the chassis, with bigger Brembo brakes, with a racy seat. So they want to be like an AMG or an M or, or an RS. And so that, I think, could actually like turn people on. Now the problem is you have to do that consistently for a very long time. And you have to stop saying you're the safest car in the world. That's what I was that's what say. We think is of. the Volvo buyer seeking that? That's the question. You know? Well, but the, Volvo does have this weird racing tradition. Like I went to this Volvo Motorsports Museum, and going back to the, the before the Amazon, the, the 544, there was a 544 race car, you know? I'd never go, Volvo, find European sports car. <laughs> it just doesn't. I, I, so I say Volvo, but, I see Soccer Mom Station Wagon. Yeah. That, yeah but, that's immediately what I think of. But I mean, until 10 years ago, like Audi, what, I don't even know what I thought of, like weirdos. But, but there's, you know? nothing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. It's really interesting to watch as, you know, the market evolves. Everyone wants to be in the performance end of luxury. So mm -hmm. everyone thinks they're going to do sporty cars. We see this with Lexus. Instead of building the world's smoothest, most refined luxury cars, they're now trying to do sporty cars. But sporty cars have been done. BMW have done it. Benz is there now. Audi's there. Surely there's room to do something different. Can Volvo be something different? Well, I mean, if you can combine like max performance with max safety, that is different and could be a selling point. It sounds heavy though. Yeah. Well, Max yeah. safety sounds really heavy. To yeah. Me. Okay. So it has an inline six, which is mounted sideways. You know, just right. just like the Daewoo I, Mangusta. <laughs> For, that's kind of cool, said, actually. And I said, I said I to the that credit. I said, I said why on earth? Yeah. I said, why on earth would you do that? I mean, inline six, you want it going north south, and they said, ah. If you do that, then the transmission's behind the engine, and when you get in an accident, yeah, the engine goes under the car, but the transmission pops up into the compartment and kills the rear seat passengers. With this, the engine and transmission both are shoved under the car. It was a safety thing. Well, we started out talking about the Audi S4, and there's one here in the parking lot at Motor Trend Towers that has, uh, it's an older one, but it has this little sticker on the back. 
one less Prius. And I hear rumors you guys have been uh, doing your part. Well, you'll have to wait for the next episode of Roadkill <laughs> oh, for that. Okay. Well, the last week's episode was pretty uh, sort of um, surreal, shall we call it that? We got a 78 Monza Spider, which is actually kind of a rare car. Factory V8 four-speed car, and we took it to the Standing Mile in Ohio and supercharged it with five leaf blowers. What a dumbass idea that was. To test it to see if the blowers actually Why made five? power. Because they because only had five left at Lowe's. That was what was in stock. <laughs> we were going to go for six. We wanted a six-pack. They only had five for sale, so. <laughs> and, and, and Wait, three grand for the car, what, 1,600 bucks in leaf blowers? And, yeah. and we went it was our... two miles an hour faster with the leaf blowers than without. And people online, it was great. They were saying, this will never work. They can't compress the air. Well, the thing is, boost is really only a measurement of restriction. And when you're not moving enough air to restrict, but you're still bringing more air and fuel into the thing, it works. It makes 20 horsepower to so, the tire. So five Husqvarna leaf blowers. Right. They were Husqvarna, wow. Husky's. Nothing but the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. top shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we he saw the expense our... report receipt, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> you refused it the first time I submitted it. <laughs> <laughs> Gave you 20 horsepower. At the wheels. And they cost? $1,600. Worth is this a value proposition or no? It? It's fitting in economics no, it's again. It's, yeah. it's science. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's science. We had to find out. There, there was a video on YouTube that we saw where somebody pointed a leaf blower at a four cylinder Chevy S10 motor and swore it made power on the dyno. And we thought, there's no way. And so we tried it on a Corvette a long time ago and it did work. So then we thought, well, if one is good, two is good, why not five? Yeah. So, so, how do you get, how did you hook? How do you get them to go? <laughs> well, How do you stop them? them? We mounted them all under the hatch. We had five guys pull starting them before every race. I had to make sure they were running. And we ducted them all into one four inch aluminum pipe that went right down the center console through the firewall and into the air cleaner. We, we learned something here. When you fired up the first one, it actually oh. made the other one spin backwards because right. they were all plumbed together. So we had to put a massive blow off valve on the charge pipe. <laughs> That was nothing more than like a plumbing valve well, for water. It was water. an RV sewage yeah. dump. <laughs> and, it, and I called it, it was VTEC. You know, you, you get them all right, fired right, up, right, right. slam it in first, take off, close the VTEC valve. Right, so VTEC kicks in, you're yeah. gone. <laughs> I could see it in the next Fast and Furious movie. When that, when that dude reaches for the nitrous yep, button. Diesel out oh. back. Give me a sec. So what's what's happened with the car after the episode? Is it going well, to a Hall of Fame or something? Because I think it's That's what's hilarious is um, we did all this at a buddy's shop, Jeff Lutz, who has run our Drag Week event for three or four years in a row. And we're thinking about turning it into a race car for Drag Week. Well, because Jeff is one of your stars at Drag Week. Isn't yeah, absolutely. It? Uh, that that uh, Drag Week event for you guys is, is amazing because they drive these seven second cars on the road. Well, we look forward to seeing what further evolution there can be on the, the Roadkill uh, Monza special. I mean, the fan car, what next? But just shifting gears a little bit now, a uh, slightly more serious subject, I guess. Uh, Ford Australia's just announced that it's uh, ending production uh, in Australia in 2016. Ford's been building cars there since 1925. Model T's were assembled there, and the Falcon's been manufactured there since uh, 1960. And I know you guys were down in Australia for a Roadkill episode uh, not that long ago, and you saw it's like America here, you know, there's the GM and Ford passion and, you know, the Commodore and the Falcon boys just go at it all the time. And it's going to be a bit sad for those enthusiasts to see a rear drive car, which you can get a V8 engine in, just go away. Holden versus Ford, and they're both Utes. I assume they won't have Ford Utes anymore. Who knows Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, uh, ironically, Ford invented the Ute. The, uh, right. the, the Ute was designed in response to uh, a farmer wrote a letter to the designer and said, I want something I can you know, work on the farm, take my pigs to market on the weekend and take my missus to the church on Sunday in her best. And so they did the closed coupe utility. In like 46 or do you 1932. know? 1932. 32, wow. It's a bummer they couldn't find a way to export some of those products to other markets. Well, everyone loves the rear drive Falcon, but the, the reality is it's an orphan platform and they really missed their chance with the, the current gen Mustang mm. and Falcon. They were, there were a lot of people within Ford saying, hey, this makes a lot of sense. You know, we need, we've got two rear drive cars. If we could do a short wheelbase for the Mustang, a medium wheelbase for the Falcon, and you could do an extended wheelbase to replace maybe the uh, town car. Um, but the two, the product cadence I've been told was just too separate. The, the 
Americans needed to make a decision, the Australians needed to make a decision, so the Australians went with their platform with independent rear end and the Mustang went and did its own business. I mean, the, to me the surprising part is that, you know, there's 22.5 million Australians, that's it. And maybe they sell their car also in New Zealand, which is another, you know, four million and it's too bad sheep don't drive, but I mean, there's, there's 20, $2 million or 22 million Southern Californians. Like Australia is a tiny market. So the fact that the Falcon survived as long as it did is really the amazing story. In 1993, those cars were, Commodore and Falcon sold uh, hunt, nearly 130,000, I think 22% of the market. Uh, last year, they were 4% of the market and Falcon sales were under, including you, were under 20,000 units. When I was a kid, you needed a, you know, an Australian built car like a Holden or a Falcon because they were tough enough to drive on unmade roads. Well, that world's changed. The Australian dollar is so strong now um, that you know, imported cars are cheaper. Gas is more expensive than it used to, so big six cylinder and eight cylinder cars are not as popular as they used to. The performance guys love them, but there's just not a market for them anymore. And Ford's decided to, to pull the pin, so. What will Ford be importing to Australia to sell? Well, I, I think they'll probably go with uh, Fusion. I don't know whether Taurus um, will make, w I think it'd just be too expensive. And it's, t t Taurus is not that good. It's, it's, no, it's terribly it's space inefficient. It's, it's very heavy. Car. It's not fuel efficient. I think the bigger question is, what does this mean for Mustang? Now we know in 20, uh, 2014, we'll see a new Mustang, but this now becomes another orphan car. And, you know, um, Alan Mulally's yeah, yeah. been on record as saying, you know, we don't do orphan cars. We don't do single country, single market cars. Yeah, okay, it's an orphan, but it's an orphan that sells 120,000 units a year minimum. And when it's new, they're gonna sell 200, 300,000 for the first couple of years. You know, so the Mustang is very profitable. Yeah, there's been rumors of a, of a, a Mustang-based sedan, a rear drive sedan. I mean, for the, for the enthusiast, it looks pretty bleak at Ford other than Mustang. If you need a four-door, if you want a four-door V8 family car, Chevy's gonna have the SS, the Holden Commodore. Um, Ford's, Ford's got nothing. Well, could it be a Lincoln? I mean, could, it, could, it, could they make a four-door uh, Mustang, put a Lincoln badge on it and do something with Lincoln? Well, you have, David, how many years have people been talking about doing a four-door Mustang type car? Yeah. Well, actually, I remember seeing drawings of them clear back in the 60s for sure, but not going to happen. Well, it just may be that the V8 performance car, or the V8 itself, may not be long for long for this world than new performance cars. I mean, they've heard rumors yeah. of the twin turbo V6 Mustang. Yeah. We can see what they've done with the, the, the Focus ST. There's a four cylinder and those turbo cars are, too. Yeah, and those cars are, or at least the Focus ST, that car's great. So maybe downsizing the displacement, adding compression, or adding a compressor is the right way to go. I think the Mustang will come to Australia. Um, mm. I think that's on, on the plan, so maybe it's not all as, as, as bleak as it seems. But you know, for me, who grew up with, uh, with with Falcons and uh, remember, you know, watching the Australian touring car racing down there, the big race at Bathurst, which is 50 years old. It was always Holden versus Falcon. It's, it's kind of the end of an era. It really is. Well, it, it, it would be like uh, Japanese cars in for the first time this year, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's like it's like you know, my first car was a Pontiac. I always had a real soft spot for Pontiac, and it's gone. And I'm okay. Things are okay. <laughs> you're gonna be okay. Are you? All right. Are you? So you're saying I'll, you're saying I'll get over it. You'll be fine. <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be totally. All right. Fine. All right. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's edition of Wide Open Throttle. Till next week. Take care.